Hey everyone, and welcome to the channel where today we're gonna to be talking about methods you can use to improve the results of your machine learning model. Now this is part of a small Kaggle series I'm doing, but if you're not interested in Kaggle, no worries. This is something that can be applied across the board. What I wanna do is break down some of the strategies I've learned from my time doing research to working at companies like Google and Amazon doing software engineering, machine learning engineering, and hopefully you will find some useful tips from this that will help you improve the results of your machine learning modeling. I do do a whole lot of content like this, so if this is the type of thing you're interested in, do consider subscribing. It means a lot and it certainly helps out the channel. Let's start with topic number one, the exploratory data analysis or EDA for short. Whenever you are working with data, you should always, 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 the first step should be to do an EDA. And that is because you need to make sure that, first of all, if you don't know what's in the data, you need to understand what's in the data. And if you think you know what's in the data, you need to confirm that and make sure you're not going into the process with any unknown biases. You want to make sure that you understand the data, everything within it, to its core. That means you should know what all the variables look like, know all the distributions, see if it's all what you expected it to be. An example of how we could exploit the structure of the data in the case of the Kaggle project we were working on, which was a project where we got excerpts of text and we had to predict the reading difficulty of the passage. Well, what we noticed was among the very hard passages and the very low passages, the standard deviation for the ratings was actually a lot higher than the other cases. So one thing we could do there is maybe weight the loss of those specific samples as lower or not treat them as, not give them as much weight considering that they're less likely to be accurate. That's just one example of many ways in which making sure that you understand what the data looks like can help you in the long run. Item number two is gonna be making sure you're using the right type of model. The first thing you should be thinking about is should I use classical machine learning or should I use deep learning? Now there are a number of reasons you might want to use one over the other, so I can't list them all here, but a general rule of thumb is tabular data that is not very complex, you know, uh, aside from maybe text and stuff, you're probably going to want to use classical machine learning, whereas unstructured data, stuff that's very complicated and that would need a lot of feature engineering, tends to work better when you're using deep learning. Now, again, that's a rule of thumb. You shouldn't take that as some scripture, but it generally works that way. So once you have figured out whether or not you should be using classical machine learning or deep learning, what you wanna find is whether or not you are using the model that is gonna work best for your problem. So you might ask, how do you figure that out? How do you know what model is gonna work best? Now, unfortunately, the answer is you don't really know. Sometimes intuition can tell you a little bit, or if you've read a lot of papers that tell you this method works really well for this specific thing, that's great. But in reality, lots of the time, we don't really know that, so it means you're gonna to have to test things. So you should be testing lots of models. Now, sometimes you can narrow it down a bit. For example, if you're using deep learning for a problem like we did in this challenge, and you're using deep uh, NLP models, I would highly recommend checking Papers with Code. It's a great website that has all sorts of benchmarks. And what we could see for the example of this challenge we were doing is that sentiment analysis, which is very similar to what we're doing because it's using regression with a deep NLP model, well, that works best with the Roberta model, or Roberta is one of the best models for doing this. So that would probably be a good indicator that this is a good model for this problem. And surprise, surprise, if we look at all the other code that some of these participants have been submitting, the vast majority of the successful ones are based off Roberta. And the last thing I wanna to touch on on this point is make sure you're fine tuning your model. There's a number of ways to do this, anything from meta learning to just playing around with the numbers yourself. Again, this is a little bit of intuition can be used here, but really you just have to test and testing takes time and effort. Item number three, this is you want to make sure that your validation method is foolproof. So people often overlook validation, not by not doing it at all, but they take it a little bit too lightly and don't spend enough time to make sure that they have a robust validation system all the time. And I found this even at professional companies like Amazon, I found horrible data leakages when people are training models and validating them, oftentimes the data will leak over and you'll get inaccurate results. So this isn't a fallacy just beginner, <laughs> beginners make. This is something even professionals in the field with PhDs, I've seen them make these issues too. So make sure you're catching yourself. You wanna double check your data, make sure nothing's getting leaked. And then you wanna make sure your validation strategy is impeccable. 
If you're using classical machine learning, you should almost always be doing a cross-validation, which is where you hold off a part of the data for testing, but you rotate that part over several training, I guess they wouldn't be quite epochs, but several training whatevers, to make sure that you're getting the absolute most out of your data. Now, normally you can't do cross-validation for deep learning, not because it's impossible, but because deep learning models generally take too long to train, so it can be hard to cross-validate just because of time constraints. For the specific Kaggle challenge we were doing, though, if you're keeping up with that, well, we're lucky because we actually don't get too much data. That's a curse on one hand, but on the other hand, that does mean that because we can train so quickly, we can actually use cross-validation, which can get us more robust models, or at least a more robust way to choose the right models. And I'm just gonna reiterate this. Even when I was working at Google on some of the most high-tech stuff out there, state-of-the-art NLP models, even then, almost my whole time working there was based off validating the results, making sure that we knew how to choose the right models. Because you can train all the models you want, but if you don't, you know, if you can't tell which one's the best or you think one's the best, but it's actually not, you're going to be pretty disappointed when it turns out the results aren't as good as you thought. Item number four is making sure that you're using all the data that is available to you and seeing if you can find any outside data that could also support your learning. At least in the context of Kaggle, you generally are given one data set to start out with, but if you look at the rules, oftentimes people are totally okay with letting you use more data from outside the competition. And this is true in the real world. Oftentimes you'll have this data set you're working with. And then if you really look, you'll find ways to generate new data. And maybe it will be slightly different, but still be able to boost your training process. And that is because machine learning is all about the data, at least if you're doing, you know, like supervised learning, it's very important. So any way you can get your hands on more data is super important. The other thing I want to lump in with this is pre-trained models. If you can do transfer learning and use pre-trained models, especially when you're using huge models, you should be doing that. Models like BERT, GPT-2, these models took millions of dollars to pre-train. I'm actually not sure BERT took that much, but I know GPT-2 or GPT-3 at least did. I think GPT-3 took an estimated $50 million. I might be wrong there, but it's a lot of money nonetheless. So. If you are running one of these big models, you want to make sure that you're using a pre-trained version to get the most out of it. Not to mention, you're probably not gonna have the time to do as good of a job at pre-training as some of these huge companies do. If you do work at a huge company and you guys wanna do the pre-training yourself, I know there is some of that at Amazon, go for it, you know, knock yourself out. But usually, usually just using a pre-trained model is gonna be the easiest way to go about things and also be the most efficient time-wise and money-wise. And lastly, if you are on Kaggle, do make sure that you check out the forums because oftentimes people are required to post there if they're using outside sources. So it's a great way for you to check out what other people are using, especially, you know, if someone's ranking at the top of the leaderboard and they posted something on the forums, well, might be, might be an interesting thing to look at. Number five and the final topic is make sure you try ensembling if you're really trying to squeeze out the last bit of performance from your model slash models. The sort of way research works in reinforcement learning is people tend to focus on one model because they want to prove the theory of it or prove that this model can do very well by itself. But in practice, when you're actually deploying models in the environment, or at least when you're competing in competitions, you want to squeeze every last bit of accuracy out of your model. And it doesn't matter if you combine all sorts of models. And what ends up being the case is that a mixture of experts, or also referred to as ensembling, is usually a great way to do that. And that's where you combine multiple models, take their outputs and combine them in some way such that you end up getting a more accurate result. And this tends to make a lot of intuitive sense, right? When you have more people working on one problem, generally they can come up with better solutions. Now you can't always do this, particularly if you have giant models, sometimes it can be hard, but even outside of Kaggle, if you look at like the squad, the, I think it's the Stanford question answering data set, you'll see all the top results are ensembles. And this is the case across the board on benchmarks, ensembles almost always perform better. So if you have the data and resources to do it, you should definitely try out ensembling. It can help a lot.
That was the last topic, and you might have noticed that I didn't talk about model-specific changes in terms of changing like the way you use activation functions or the way you connect up synapses, and that's because there are so many different things you can do, and it's just such an open field for research where new things are coming out every day, and the state of the art is constantly changing. So if that is something you want to learn more about, I do, you know, do consider subscribing to the channel where I cover a lot of those papers, what lots of the new methods are, and lots of the ways to build some really cool models. So if that's something you're interested in, it is something I talk about a lot and I always appreciate new people joining the community. It's a great community and we're growing. But anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. That's all I had for now and I hope to catch you next time.